So for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Daniel Corcal. I'm obviously one of the residents here. I'm in the uh, FR Emergency Medicine Program. I'm one of the third years. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, a talk that I termed uh, STEMI equivalence, and we'll, we'll get into why that might actually be a bit of a misnomer in a little bit. But before I start, I wanted to thank my supervisor, Dr. Elizabeth Haney, uh, for all her hard work and guidance, uh, as well as a special thanks to uh, Dr. Michael Ward. I'm not sure if he's here yet, but uh, hopefully will be joining us at some point. Uh, he's been an amazing asset and, and uh, has given me a ton of his time and, and been a real resource in terms of putting this talk together. Uh, and we'll hopefully be here as well at the end to, to sort of uh, answer questions and provide um, insight from, a, from the interventional cardiology perspective. So uh, without any further ado, I have no conflicts to declare. Um, and then this is what I'm hoping to cover today. And I think it looks, it looks really manageable in this slide, but we're actually hoping to cover a lot of ground. So I'll, I'll try to move quickly through the first portion, uh, reviewing uh, what the STEMI is and how we ended up there. And then we'll try to spend a good chunk of time reviewing STEMI equivalence and the evidence behind it, which was one of the things I was really curious about because I think we, we hear about these sort of uh, on shift and maybe in a med school lecture, uh, but what do we actually know about sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value? So we'll spend a little bit of time on that. And then I wanted to actually cover uh, a relatively recent uh, study, uh, the difficult study. Uh, and it's a, it's a study out of Turkey. Uh, and it was one of the, the driving factors for why I chose this topic and, and sort of provides a little bit of uh, context um, in terms of how we might think about these STEMI equivalents in our practice. And then the last thing, I just, I, I just want to make sure that at the end of the day, uh, this comes back to the patients we actually see. So uh, just, to, just to, to put this, uh, to get everyone in the same frame of mind, I, I wanted to start off with a brief case just to, to get the neurons firing. And I, I, the, the, all the juniors can relax. I'm not going to call on anyone for this. Uh, I just want you to think about what you might do and how you might interpret this ECG. Uh, 65 male is presented to the emergency room with relapsing and remitting central chest pain. Uh, by the time he's actually assessed at the triage, his vital signs are normal uh, and his pain's gone away. And he's actually, he walks up to the nurse who had initially triaged him and, and asks if he can leave. Uh, the nurse is a little bit dubious about that, comes and finds you, hands you this ECG and asks if the patient can go home. So uh, I'll just encourage you to, to kind of take a second to, to digest that ECG. Um, and I, I'm sure most of you uh, have some strong opinions about whether or not this patient can go home, uh, but I wanted to, to sort of plant that spark. While you're thinking about that, um, I, I, I was, I'm always really curious about why we do what we do and where the evidence came from and, and the points of departure. So uh, a brief history lesson as a context builder for the STEMI um, component. Uh, heart attacks as an entity are actually a relatively new phenomenon, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, in the late 19th century, post-mortem evidence, uh, the, the proliferation of the autopsy as, as a scientific tool, of course, was happening. And there was mounting post-mortem evidence of coronary occlusion uh, with a relationship to myocardial infarction and ischemia. However, it took about 50 years before people really started to put this in the context of clinical syndromes. And, um, and, and in the context of the morbidity and mortality we now associate with it. Uh, and it really wasn't until uh, the 1950s that uh, global health bodies, specifically the World Health Organization, were working together to put together common nomenclature uh, and criteria. Uh, in those early days, of course, the, the electrocardiogram had been around for a while at that time, and, and people were beginning to appreciate uh, the, the, that reflected the underlying pathology. Um, however, the, the emphasis was really on the findings after the heart attack. The, the Q wave and non-Q wave MI, as they were called. Uh, and so this, this is from uh, Nomenclature and Criteria for Diagnosis of Ischemic Heart Disease from a 1979 paper uh, where they provide unequivocal evidence uh, on electrocardiogram, which would be persistent Q waves or QS waves lasting longer than one day, and equivocal evidence, uh, meaning it could or couldn't be uh, an ischemic event uh, with a stationary injury current, which as best as I can figure out is ST elevation, uh, or a symmetrical inversion of the T wave, which is interesting, uh, a transient pathologic Q wave or conduction disturbances. So sort of a, a really broad net there. From there though, um, you know, of course, with uh, an increasing 
uh, understanding in the advent of angiography uh, and uh, reperfusion therapies, uh, surgical analytics. Um, there was a large meta-analysis published in 1994 by a group that termed themselves the fibrinolytic therapy trialists. Uh, and they found, um, they were really trying to answer this question of, well, who do we lice? Who benefits? And so they found a couple things uh, that were really interesting. Uh, the first thing they found, of course, is that there's, uh, with providing lytics, there was a bump in all comers uh, in the first 24 hours, but then there was a mortality benefit from two to 30 days afterwards. And of course, um, the other thing that they found, uh, and this is where our STEMI criteria really comes from, is that uh, those individuals who benefited the most from mortality perspective either had a new left, left bundle branch block or a STEMI. And, uh, and we'll, we'll sort of return to left bundle branch blocks throughout the day. Otherwise, you know, the definition of STEMI has also evolved and, and ACS in general and, and MIs uh, to include biomarkers as those became more prevalent and sensitive and specific. Um, and then the most recent uh, working definition is a really, is a really like a, 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 um, a fantastic piece of international collaboration between the European Society of Cardiologists, the American Heart Association, the American Cardiologist College, and the World Health Federation uh, that culminates in a, in a uh, I think it's a 120 page document that is the 2018 fourth universal definition of MI. And we'll refer to that document a couple of times for our talk, namely right now. So just to, to sort of round off this tour of what is a STEMI, this is the definition of an MI that, that you know, we were sort of teaching in med school, schools and is accepted throughout the cardiology world. Uh, and there's, there's three things that I'll draw your attention to today. Um, so if, if you read the full text there, they look for clinical evidence of acute myocardial ischemia uh, with detection of a rise or fall of troponin uh, with at least one value above the 99th percentile centile, and at least one of the following. And of course, for us today, talking about STEMI equivalents on ECG, we're really interested in the ECG changes. But what are the accepted uh, criteria for a STEMI? Uh, again, I, I hope this is review, so I'll move very quickly, but the important things here is that the leads and the sex of the patient and the age of the patient uh, matter in terms of how we interpret uh, the ECGs of our patients uh, for, for STEMI criteria. And this was something that, that is now included in the fourth universal uh, definition of MI, and I think previously had, had come from the ESC, uh, at least that was the first time that I had seen it. So uh, just a couple more points about uh, STEMIs before we start talking about things that aren't STEMIs, but maybe we should treat like STEMIs. Um, the interpretation of uh, the J point is I think something that can be, can be a little bit of a challenge, you know, especially as a junior learner I struggled with. So I wanted to include this slide here. Uh, we can see after the P uh, section, uh, the profuse, this proceeding, excuse me, after the P section, uh, we move into the Q section and that that arrow with uh, the one there is of course our J point. And so uh, I know some of the cardiologists will talk about uh, like a PQ segment and sort of placing a ruler there and that's our point of reference. Uh, and then of course two shows the onset of the ST segment. Um, sorry, I apologize. One is not the J point, it's, it's the PQ segment. The J point is uh, the, the initiation of the T wave rather. Uh, so that's the what we're measuring there, the difference between those two when we talk about this criteria here of millimeters. So the final bit of STEMI review uh, is, of course, that the, the uh, STEMIs uh, come in territories, and that, that sort of increases the, our concern when we see ST elevation. There's a broad differential for ST elevation, which we won't get into today. Um, but these domains, of course, uh, then correlate with the underlying vasculature. I think this is a, a really uh, neat schematic. Uh, the one thing that I might change, though, is the, the portion that says aorta, I think, could also say uh, left main coronary artery there over AVR. But we'll talk more about that in a bit. So uh, just as a final bit of review here, if I could uh, bother um, one or two of our juniors to help me uh, interpret these ECGs. Obviously, we're talking about STEMIs. Um, so it is, uh, I think I saw, let's see, who do we have? Uh, Rebecca, Rebecca, would you mind telling me what you see? Sounds good. Um, so just looking here, 
learning about the J point. I see some ST elevation there and V2, V3 are the most pronounced. So that would be an anterior MI. <clears throat> um, and then looking for reciprocal depression. Um, I don't actually see any like obvious ST depression in this ECG. Obviously with an anterior, I'm looking for inferior using the pales mnemonic, but I don't see that, but I do see that ST depression. So I'd call it anterior. Yay. Yeah, certainly. And, and maybe three is a little bit flat, if anything. But yeah, no, I, I'd agree with you that I don't see a ton. Can I bother you to help me with one more ECG? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, would you mind taking a shot at this one? I like this one better. Um, so this one you can see quite pronounced ST elevation in um, leads two, three AVF. So those are the inferior leads. And pardon me, I'm only doing like ST segments. I haven't fully interpreted this ECG, um, but it looks like there is some reciprocal depression um, in AVR. And then there is some actually in like AVL, V1 and two as well. Um, so I would call this inferior MI. And then with inferior MI, I'm also looking to see if I think it's more of like an RCA infarct. Um, and that would, I would think that this would be the case because the, the ST elevation is much greater in three than it is in two. Um, I don't see any of the ST depression in lead one, but that's another thing I would look for. That's great. Yeah. And, and then of course we're with these infarcts, of course, they're notoriously associated with things like the basal Jirash reflex, and uh, they can be very volume dependent as well. So thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, we'll leave you alone. I've got two more ECGs. Uh, I was hoping someone could help me with. Alex, I see you in the chat. Would you mind uh, in, uh, taking a shot at this one? Sure. <clears throat> so I think the obvious things I'm seeing are sort of ST elevations in the lateral leads, as well as in one. There are some reciprocal changes in three AVF. There is ST elevation in AVL, and then ST depression in V1, uh, kind of through V3. So I'd be worried sort of about um, maybe a lateral uh, uh, or LED, um, as well as uh, maybe a bit of a uh, a posterior infarct with uh, the changes in V1 and V2. Fantastic. And then, uh, so you sort of alluded to my next point here, and, and it's sort of what's left, but uh, do you mind? Uh, so I guess the question is, what would you order if you saw this? Uh, 15 lead. Sorry, there we go. <laughs> Unmuted myself. A hundred percent. Thank you so much, Alex and Rebecca, for your help with that. Um, so that that sort of concludes this the STEMI review. The only other point I'll make here is that uh, we looked at the criteria in terms of uh, voltage and um, millimeters. The one thing to bear in mind is when we move to those posterior leads, uh, we drop our our SD our threshold for ST uh, significant ST elevation down to zero point five uh, for leads V seven through nine. So thank you so much, Rebecca and Alex, for helping us review that. So let's move on to things that aren't STEMIs, uh, but maybe we should think about like STEMIs. So just as a means to introducing this topic, um, I think I alluded to this earlier, but this was something where I think this, well, this, this podcast uh, came out of the EM Crit blog in 2015, and I was a first year medical student at the time, just uh, discovering my interest in emergency medicine. And I think I, I'd heard um, about STEMI equivalents. And I was sort of very, really fascinated by this topic at the time and listened to the podcast, obviously. And, uh, and uh, I'll be honest, probably some of it went over my head at that period. Uh, but in hindsight, it sort of really piqued my interest. It was the first time I heard about this. And to be honest, I don't think I, I otherwise learned much about this in medical school. Um, that being said, in my first two years of, uh, of emergency medicine here, I've certainly seen a couple of these, as, as I'm sure we all have. The other thing that made me want to do this topic today was um, a relatively recent trial that I think um, unfortunately, it was published just as, uh, as the pandemic was really getting off the ground and was sort of lost in that fear, uh, but something that I thought was quite interesting and, and, uh, and drove that. But we'll talk about that after we, we kind of go over these, um, 
these various ST equivalents. So the first thing I wanted to start with is left bundle branch block before uh, we use up all our neurons and concentration, because I find this to be probably the most challenging. Um, I have two left bundle branch blocks here. And of course, without the clinical context, it's difficult. But I'll tell you, one of them is having an MI and one of them is not. And I think the point that I wanted to make is, of course, this is a very this is not an eyeball diagnosis, at least not for me. I'm sure there's there's some folks in the audience who who are who are saying that I 100% see the am I already? Um, but this is something where we need sort of uh, criteria, and that criteria can be a little challenging. Of course, I'm referring to the Scarbosa criteria. So this again was something where I, where I took a little bit of a dive back, and where did where did all this come from? So in 1996, um, a paper by Elena Scarbosa et al. Uh, they looked at data from the GUSTO trial. And what they were really concerned with was these left bundle branch MIs. Uh, and as we stated in that 1994 paper um, from the uh, fibrinolytic trialist group, they'd already sort of discovered that there was something significant about these left bundle branches. And, and there was that initial uh, recommendation that all new left bundle branches or presumed new left bundle branches should be lysed. Uh, and of course, over the years um, that didn't necessarily pan out in the data and there was an understanding for an increasing need uh, to, to sort of parse these people out and so as early as 1996 uh, there, there was sort of an understanding of that and uh, that's when Elena Scarbosa, Scarbosa excuse me uh, and all came up with this criteria um, so this study looked at all the left bundle branch um, blocks in this database was a relatively massive international database. They defined uh, ACS primarily on a troponin rise, so maybe a little bit differently than some of the more contemporary studies. And they ultimately settled on three criteria from this study. And I have them here listed schematically as well as in the flow chart to the right. But essentially, uh, concordant one millimeter uh, elevation, uh, a discordant five millimeter elevation or ST elevation in V1 through three. Uh, I think the, the challenging thing here again is, is uh, so what's concordant and what's discordant? Uh, the most simple way to describe it is the concordant, of course, moves uh, in the same direction as the QRS, the ST elevation uh, or depression, and discordant moves in the opposing direction. So you'll see on the figure under Scarbosa's criteria there, the one on the left is concordant and the one in the middle is discordant. They ultimately uh, put this into a scoring system, which I think kind of it, it's a for for my simple brain it adds another layer of complexity to this, something that's already a little bit challenging. Um, but they did put this in, in their initial um, paper. They put together this schematic here where you could kind of go through a yes or no format. I found that a little bit helpful. Uh, the, the nice thing about this is that you ended up with an actual probability of MI. And if you look down at the bottom there, if even if you just have one of the criteria, or, or sorry, none of the criteria in their pretest group, you still had 16%. If you had one of the criteria, is there ST segment elevation greater than five millimeters, there's this coordinate to the QRS, you got 50%. So they, they ultimately provided a scoring system here with two, three, and five points, um, depending on, on which questions. That ultimately, though, um, that scoring system and, and criteria has been somewhat um, criticized. And a paper in 2013 uh, yielded the Smith modified Scarbosa criteria. And the big difference here um, in terms of, of the modification of the criteria was they were aiming for a more sensitive and specific study. Uh, and what you can see, if you look here at uh, line three and one in table four there, is that they did markedly increase their sensitivity and specificity as well. Um, um, and, and so they sort of talk, um, flaunt this as, as a much improved one. Uh, what, so what did they change? Uh, let's take a look at that. So these are the various different things that they, they examined in their pursuit for an improved uh, Scarbosa criteria to yield those higher sensitivities and specificities. Uh, a and B circled at the top, you'll of course recognize from the first two components. So the ST segment elevation greater than one millimeter uh, and concordant with QRS in at least one lead and ST segment depression greater than or equal to one millimeter uh, in any of leads V1 through three. 
the thing that they changed was this proportional component where the STS uh, ratio, excuse me, um, of uh, sometimes it's referred to as 0.25 and sometimes referred to as 0.3 uh, was significant. The other thing that they changed was they got rid of the scoring system and it's now a, a binary tool. It's either positive or negative. And I do believe that, yeah, I just wanted to review this whole uh, STS thing because I, I found that confusing as well here. So we can see on the left in A, they, they very kindly measured out the segments for us uh, that we have uh, 10 millimeters compared to the, the, the three millimeter deflection uh, for the ST component. And this yields a, a ratio of 0 0.3. So depending on if you're using the 0.25 or 0.3 rule, uh, that's negative, whereas uh, the 10.5 to 3.5 is now positive. And you can sort of understand that when you're measuring this out on, on an ECG, that this can be a little bit challenging uh, and that, you know, a, a, a millimeter here or there all of a sudden creates the difference between a positive and a negative score. So definitely challenging to interpret. That being said, I did want to provide us with one uh, um, example here just to, to try and force our brains through it. Um, and again, I, I think this is a great example. It's obviously got the, the circle sign uh, to tell you a little bit or to direct your, your eye a little bit. Um, but it, it is a challenging system to use. And I, I just wanted to emphasize this with a, a challenging ECG because I'm not 100% sure I would nail this if I was given it. Uh, but what, what I'm trying to illustrate there is that there is a concordant uh, ST elevation of one millimeter in AVL, um, if you look very closely there. Uh, and so it, it sort of speaks to the nuance here and, and the challenges in us bundle branch um, interpretation. Uh, but uh, so that's the evidence. One thing I, I haven't included, but I'll pay lip service, is that there is um, an evolving body of literature around a potential new criteria uh, called the Barcelona criteria which I believe is um, sort of emerging. And, and I suppose we'll see if that takes over and we, we just stop talking about Scarbosas and we start talking about Barcelona's, but uh, relatively similar uh, with a couple caveats similar to the modified. So that's left bundle branches out of the way. Let's turn our attention now to V1 T-waves. This was something that I don't think I'd actually heard very much about before. Um, and uh, it was something I learned about in researching this presentation. So what I'm talking about with a V1 T wave is an upright T wave in V1 that is greater than the T wave in V6. Uh, and it's sort of described even going back to the 60s as being sort of a universally abnormal feature and it's suggestive of coronary artery disease. So how suggestive is it? Well, uh, to be honest, the studies on this topic aren't great, so I'll, I'll focus on two and then provide a little bit of a review um, that was recently published as well. So a study by Mano et al. in 1983 uh, looked at 218 individuals undergoing diagnostic catheterization, um, it's angiography, of course, for chest pain, uh, and found that 75%, uh, or, or sorry, excuse me, they, their cutoff for defining significant courier Nary artery disease with 75% stenosis. So a clinically significant endpoint for sure. What they found uh, was that 20% uh, with single vessel disease had an upright T wave in V1. And this, this had a, a preponderance for the left circumflex uh, artery. 27% had two vessel disease and 35% with three vessel disease. There's no discussion about uh, use of lytics or revascularization in the study. And so I was, I was a little bit disappointed with this because I'm not entirely sure uh, how to use this information in my practice. But it was, so it was really just an epidemiologic description. Stankovic et al. in 2012 uh, took this a little bit further and had a, had a, a much more rigorous study looking at 2,468 uh, patients who went, underwent angiography. The only thing was that they weren't necessarily for ACS. Uh, so it was sort of a, a bit of an opportunistic sample uh, and the clinical, uh, the external validity there kind of goes down. But at any rate, they, they also focused in on these 126 who had a normal ECG. And I think that's important because that's really what we're talking about here is these, uh, these ECGs that are otherwise unremarkable. 73 had an upright T wave in lead V1 and 50, over 50% 50 of those had significant coronary artery disease, uh, whereas uh, a T wave that was inverted in lead one uh, 
Uh, only 23% had significant coronary disease. Uh, they also looked at stress test data, um, but again, there wasn't any data around revascularization or is this, um, is, should this be an indication for early revascularization? But they do provide a specificity and sensitivity uh, of the 77 and 71 respectively um, for an otherwise normal ECG with uh, LA, uh, with um, uh, a T, an upright T wave. Uh, greater than V6. So uh, that's, I, I highlight those two because I think there's, that was sort of like the, one of the more important index studies from a ischemic perspective, as well as one of the, the better done studies. But the uh, Cure et al. Uh, in, uh, published a very recent literature review looking at this. And ultimately, this is, this is the sum total of the data available on V1 T ways. Um, I think this is challenging data in a, in, in a couple of ways because ultimately it's all from retrospective data. Uh, there's no actual evidence about early uh, revascularization um, if we're thinking about STEMI equivalents. But I think this does sort of confirm in my mind that this V1 T waves, which is something I wasn't really evaluating for previously, is probably falling into the high risk ECG category. I think that's how I would describe it ultimately. Um, Kira et al. also uh, did do a great job of, of uh, explaining some of the caveats with this, which is that in hyperkalemia, young athletes, uh, thin people, and LVH, this isn't a terribly useful um, uh, criteria to determine a high-risk ECG. Uh, and similarly to, to kind of what I've described here, the authors conclude that it, it can play a role in stratifying the patients, predicting the possibility of coronary artery disease, uh, and maybe reducing the threshold for coronary angiography in some patients. And I think that'll, that'll ultimately be a punchline we keep coming back to at the end of the day is um, uh, some of these that we talk about are maybe more so in that true STEMI equivalent category where you see it and it's reflexive to call the cath lab. And then I think a lot of these fall into the high risk, have a conversation with the interventionalist category with the right patient in front of you. But at any rate, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll recap later. The next um, high risk or, or STEMI equivalent pattern that I hope to discuss was Wellen syndrome. And I think this is something uh, we've all heard of it before, but we'll, we'll just quickly recharacterize it here, but biphasic or deeply inverted T waves in V2 and 3. The other thing that's, that's sort of interesting and ominous about Wellen syndrome, of course, is that it, it can be a pain-free or pain-resolved patient. And of course, the Wellen syndrome was what we saw in our first ECG there. Um, and there's an association here with uh, stenosis of the left anterior descending. So just to, to have some visual representation of what we're talking about with Wellens, um, I, I found this sort of interesting, and this wasn't really part of my conceptual model of Wellens before doing this, uh, doing this presentation, but Wellens exists in a continuum. Um, so we see on the left there this terminal T wave inversion uh, progressing potentially to this B pattern of symmetric T wave inversion. And uh, I just wanted to provide another ECG here to draw your eyes to that V2, V3, the biphasic T wave that goes up and then down and, and sort of worth, worth, uh, worth storing that away and, and having a bit of a, a clang association there. Uh, because I think this is the one where, where someone comes in, they had some chest pain, but now they feel better. And can I get out of here, doc? And um, of course, we need to be really vigilant for this. So what is the actual data from uh, the literature on this? Well, um, sparse. Sparse is the answer for something that, that I think is so well established in our education compared to maybe some of these other ones. Uh, there was really only uh, two or three studies, and they're relatively small. Um, the two most major studies were both conducted by Dr. Wellen. The first one in 1982, it was a retrospective uh, review of 145 patients admitted with unstable angina. And uh, a staggering almost 20% of them had a Wellens pattern, which for me, there's a little bit of dissonance there in that I don't feel like I see 20% of uh, our unstable angina patients having a Wellens pattern. But at any rate, um, they, th this was retrospective, and, and when they analyzed the data, 75% of these uh, went on to develop regional wall motion abnormalities uh, that would have corresponded with an LAD domain. So this sort of uh, piqued the interest of Dr. Well, and he went on to uh, do a prospective trial with over 200 patients. And what he found from that was over 
of people with a Wellen sign uh, and greater than 50% stenosis had no rise in biomarkers. Uh, so even though they were having intermittent chest pain, uh, and I think the, the point there that I wanted to make was that this can be uh, very sneaky for us in that you can have someone who's saying their chest pain's gone, they, they don't have biomarkers, uh, but we need to remain vigilant for that Wellen sign. The next one uh, I was hoping to broach was uh, the hyperacute T waves or De Winter's T waves. So these are tall symmetrical T waves in V1 and V6 uh, with greater than one millimeter of J point depression. So there's depression followed by a peaked T wave. Uh, and some uh, people have likened these to like the hyperkalemia T waves and you know the painful to sit on is, is another description, uh, which I think is humorous. But at any rate, um, these, these initially show up uh, with the absence of um, ST elevation, but they can progress. Uh, sometimes there's reciprocal elevation in AVR. And these are sort of interesting, and we'll get to this, in that part of the reason we see this, uh, as theorized by Dr. DeWinters, is he thinks that these are basically anatomical variants of a STEMI to some degree. Um, and these individuals might have slightly different uh, Purkinje fibers or might have a ischemic depletion of um, their potassium ATP pumps, which is why we're not seeing necessarily uh, delay in conduction and ST elevation that we would um, otherwise. So uh, again, diving into a bit of the evidence here, uh, this is from a 1998 to 2008. So over a decade, uh, Dr. DeWinters collected data on uh, 1,890 patients who underwent PCI specifically of the LAD. And I think the most compelling component here is that 2% had hyperacute T waves without ever progressing to ST elevation, but had significant LAD disease. So I think the takeaway for me there is that there, there is a small subset of these patients who will never actually progress to an ST elevation, but could have a complete infarction, uh, as well as um, um, having a, a, a critical stenosis that might actually benefit from the cath lab. So small, uh, but, but potentially clinically relevant group. And then in terms of um, uh, looking at uh, the positive predictive value here, this is a, uh, a review paper uh, by Morris and Bodie published in 2017. Um, and it, it again, it's, it's interesting because we're, they're very fascinating topics. They, they're small-ish subsets of patients, but the data is so scant for some of these. You can see the numbers there for, for the various studies, but we're looking at like 21, 35, and 6 ECGs uh, to create these numbers. So uh, I think it's worth taking with a grain of salt but they are obviously quoting a uh, very high positive predictive values and something we should of course be vigilant for as well, uh, the hyperacute, the winter's two ways. AVR, um, this was something that I, I think I've seen now a couple times. And, and what, what I'm talking about here is AVR ST elevation with multi-lead ST depression uh, and usually coordinated with, correlated with either triple vessel disease or left main coronary artery disease. So again, diving into a bit of the evidence. Uh, this was a review paper by Williamson et al. And they went over the three uh, sort of seminal papers on AVR elevation. And they basically, I, I won't belabor, I'm conscious of the time here, so I won't belabor the point, but uh, sensitivities and specificities sort of across the board, looking at patients uh, with pre presenting with ACS and only AVR elevation is in the 80s, uh, sort of ranging from the 70s to 80s. And um, again, I, I do want to make that caveat that triple vessel disease is still definitely on the differential for these patients and something to bear in mind. And of course, those patients with triple vessel disease might not benefit from the cath lab, uh, though they might from a diagnostic perspective and an expedited cabbage. But um, so that definitely an interesting phenomenon and certainly one I've seen a couple of times now as well. The last thing I did want to say, um, I'd, I'd actually hope to say a bit more of this, but for the sake of time, I'm, I'm going to just uh, put this out there and leave it to marinate. But um, the there are important caveats, like anything we do in medicine. There, there, are, there's a patient populations with a preponderance for false positives, uh, and I think the the there was these five groups that were recurrent. So uh, people with LVH, people with pericarditis, young, thin, and athletic. 
um, and the potential for lead reversal as well as bundle branch blocks can quickly confound uh, our interpretation of some of these high risk or STEMI equivalent ECGs. So um, now that we've reviewed these alternative, uh, not alternative, high risk and, and STEMI, uh, potential STEMI equivalent ECGs, uh, that brings me to the, the paper that sort of uh, reinvigorated my interest in this topic. So this is um, uh, published in 2020 uh, in Heart and Vasculature and um, a, a paper that came out of Turkey. And what they asked essentially was given the known deficiencies of STEMI criteria, would an alternative ECG criteria be more reliable uh, for cath lab activation? So that's really, and I think that's a fantastic question. They, in their background, they cite um, some literature stating that up to 30% of um, acute coronary occlusions or ACOs uh, are missed by the STEMI criteria. And so that's sort of their emphasis. Uh, this was a single center study. As I said, it's a tertiary care center with PCI capacity uh, in Turkey. And this was a retrospective case control. More specifically, uh, they uh, looked at uh, over 15,000 patients with clinically suspicious presentations for ACS. So that was where they started off was uh, triage complaints essentially for chest pain as best as I can figure from the study. And, and from that, that large group of patients, they identified over 1,000 people with STEMI, over 2,000 people with non-STEMI, and they took 1,000 of each and put them in their study. So uh, just to walk you through it with the schematic on the bottom, starting on the left, they had clinically likely ACS. They went back through the chart and looked for ECGs, troponins, angiography, and, and echocardiograms at uh, admission 24 and 48 hours. And what they ultimately defined as, um, they referred to as their composite ACO uh, outcome was angiographic evidence of occlusion, a highly elevated peak troponin, and they were using uh, troponin T uh, and looking at zero to 0 0.04 as the normal range, uh, but they were looking at a, a, an, an initial trope of either five nanograms, uh, so almost a thousand fold increase over normal, or excuse me, a hundred fold increase, so a very large uh, troponin bump or a peak of one uh, nanogram per liter within 24 hours, or a rest with clinical evidence of ACO. They never defined this, but I'm assuming it, it's that they had a STEMI on an ECG and then died or post-mortem evidence. At any rate, they then, uh, two cardiologists took turns. Uh, that both, all the ECGs were reviewed by at least two cardiologists. Uh, ECGs they disagreed on went to a third cardiologist uh, to analyze um, for these potential uh, non-STEMI uh, equivalents. So um, they do provide this supplementary table, uh, and this is how they've subdivided this. And I, I apologize, this, this gets a little confusing, so I'll, I'll try to use consistent nomenclature here. But essentially, for our purposes, what we really care about from their, from their diagnostic criteria for examining ECGs is the 1A and 1B group. So 1A is our STEMI group essentially. So clearly diagnostic. Um, and 1B is uh, the group that does not necessarily meet criteria for STEMI, but demonstrates other highly suggestive features. And they specifically mention hyperacute T waves, the winter's pattern, and uh, subtle ST segment elevation with reciprocal depression. They go on to provide two ECGs here uh, as, as um, um, examples of what they mean by the 1B group. And this, of course, is a De Winters pattern. Uh, and then this one I thought was sort of more interesting because other than being kind of low voltage, I, I, I thought this was a very unremarkable ECG. This is a patient who ultimately went on to have uh, a massive troponin bump and uh, as per the authors did very poorly, but they quote subtle ST elevation in leads 2, 3 AVF uh, with reciprocal depression in leads 1 AVL and V2. Uh, so this would have been something where the, re the reviewers on retrospective chart review would have looked at the CCG and gone back and reclassified it into that 1B category. Um, so uh, what, a, what did they find when they looked at these 1B? Uh, so the individuals with a non-STEMI, but when they re-examined their ECGs, felt that there was some high-risk component or STEMI equivalent. Ultimately, they felt that 28% 
um, of their group of non-STEMIs were actually re, uh, should have been reclassified or were reclassified for their study and, and analysis into the ECG1B group. 76% were non-criteria ST elevation with reciprocal depression. So they didn't meet those cutoffs of, of 2.5 or 2 uh, millimeters, depending on, on age. Um, and 12.4 uh, had hyperacute T waves, 6.3 had subtle anterior ST elevation, and 4.9 had non-consecutive leads with ST elevation. Um, it's interesting to compare across the groups, though, uh, for their composite uh, outcome of ACO. And if you'll recall, that's angiographic evidence, a huge troponin rise or, or death in the context uh, of felt that it was to be a STEMI or uh, excuse me, an acute coronary occlusion. So 61% of that uh, one A or one B group, which I, this is where it gets confusing because they're also referred to as non-STEMI group A, um, but these are the ECGs one B, 61% of those people actually had um, an acute coronary occlusion, uh, whereas 85% in the STEMI group did uh, and 25% in the non-STEMI group B. And this sort of speaks to one of the author's lead conclusions, which I'll, I'll, I'll emphasize in a moment. But just to continue um, uh, with the results section here, uh, comparing um, this, uh, what they sort of term to be a COMI. Uh, a COMI really means the inclusion of 1B with 1A. The non-STEMIs, high-risk ECGs with the STEMI ECGs, uh, they felt that there was much higher sensitivity, uh, not, well, so that's, I, should, I should watch my hyperbole. There was higher sensitivity and specificity as well as positive predictive values at statistically significant levels in um, predicting acute coronary occlusion. Um, I'll have you ignore the weighted and, and uh, the weighted STEMI and ACOMI numbers. Essentially, just for, for information's sake, those looked at, um, uh, admission rates, and obviously this was retrospective, so that impacted their capacity to analyze the data, but we see the trend continued and the significance continued. When they looked at mortality, uh, and they did, when they say long-term mortality, they actually followed these patients out to 800 days, and I'll show you the, the Kaplan-Meier curve in a moment, um, but similarly, they found that there was improved sensitivity, specificity, and positive predictive value. Of course, this time, uh, it's not uh, quite as significant, or it's not significant, I should say, though when they use the weighted criteria controlling for uh, rates of admission, they do regain that significance, and they sort of hold that up and say, well, it is probably significant once you control for that. The, the one thing, though, I would draw your eye to here is that we are talking about uh, improvements of maybe five points for sensitivity, one point for specificity here, our positive predictive value goes up by one. Uh, similarly, going back here to the um, predictive power for acute coronary occlusion, these aren't massive shifts. They're statistically significant, they're what their study was powered for, um, but they aren't massive shifts. And, and I'll have you keep that in the back of your mind when we come to the discussion. So continuing on with mortality, um, they did, of course, suffer from loss of follow-up. You can see uh, by 800 days, they're looking at 50 STEMI patients, 29 of those non-STEMI A patients, which again are the patients with a 1B ECG. I appreciate that's confusing. Um, and uh, 50 of the non-STEMI B and 350 of their controls. The thing the authors uh, felt was important here, though, is the green line uh, the blue line is, of course, our STEMI patients with the highest degree of mortality. Uh, the green line are, are those 1B ECGs, the, are the people who are reclassified to um, having an acute coronary occlusion based on this uh, broader ECG interpretation criteria. And the authors feel that, that this, this sort of is the whole story with these guys is they're, they're not necessarily as bad off from a mortality perspective as the STEMI patients, but they're not true and STEMIs. They, they're more closely related in terms of what they look like in outcomes to the STEMI people than the end STEMI people. And, and that's, that's what they're trying to draw your eye to here. Uh, I also think that, that one of the really fantastic things, one of the things I really like about this study though, was that they did ultimately look at really important clinical outcomes. Um, so they actually compared early and late um, uh, PCI for these uh, for these people, and obviously, I, th I think they're a bit more liberal with their PCI uh, than than we might find locally. 
um, because they had a decent number here. But uh, what they what they found here, if it, uh, so on the left side, you'll see 1A and 1B. And of course, that's referring to the ECGs we, we kind of went over earlier. Um, but for those 1A people who are the STEMIs, there is an obvious benefit to early uh, cath lab activation, right? We see 11.7 uh, long-term mortality at 800 days compared to 20.6 for those who had to wait, wait longer than two hours for the cath lab. Whereas we see a 7.7 and 7.5 um, for early and, and late ECGs. I think there's a couple important things here. One, uh, or probably the most important thing is that these are relatively small numbers. They're looking at seven deaths out of 91 and 11 out of 147. But the other thing though, is that there isn't an obvious benefit to taking these 1B people uh, necessarily to the cath lab early. That being said, um, the, they go, they take it a step further though. And actually when they analyze uh, the non 1B, so, so we have our type A's, 1A's, which again is our STEMI's, our type 1B's, uh, which is the, the potential STEMI equivalents or high risk ECG's. And then the non ACO predicting is what they've labeled it here, but really they mean all other comers who are taking the cath lab. There is actually harm. Um, and it's statistically significant. And I, I think that's an important thing for us to keep in the back of our, our minds when we ask the cardiologist to take uh, these potential high-risk ECGs uh, to, or consider taking these high-risk ECGs to the cath lab is that a trip to the cath lab is not free for the patient from a clinical perspective. Uh, the bad things can happen. There, there's dye and, uh, you know, especially uh, for our um, renally injured patients, that, that, that can be significant. There is, of course, uh, horrible and rare outcomes like coronary artery dissection. So it, it's important to remember that the, taking everybody to the cath lab is not a good thing. Um, the final component, though, that I wanted to share here was they did also look at all comer or um, uh, two other forms of re or a composite revascularization, revascularization uh, outcome here or, or um, intervention, I should say, which was looking at patients who got cabbage and or PCI and what was their impact on long term mortality. So they weren't looking at timing here, but rather uh, cabbage and PCI. And unsurprisingly, there does appear to be now uh, a mortality benefit for uh, those 1B people. Um, so 1A there, of course, these, the STEMIs again, 47% uh, mortality without revascularization and 12% uh, at 800 days with revascularization. For our 1B group, uh, that's 15% with no revascularization and 8%. So maybe these are people who might not benefit from a, a PCI strategy, but might benefit from angiography and early cabbage. I don't think you can make that conclusion from the study. I think it's rather a question that this study raises. Uh, and of course, these are relatively small numbers and unfortunately not statistically significant, despite the difference. And again, though, we see for the others that there, there is harm to revascularization in these people who don't need it. So... Um, I see that I'm, I'm running a bit short on time here, so I'll try to be brief in my concluding remarks, but the, the authors conclude the ACAMI, non ACAMI, which is acute coronary MI, occlusion, sorry, acute coronary occlusion MI, non acute coronary occlusion MI, which is again to reiterate is the 1A and 1B group or STEMI and the high risk potential STEMI equivalent groups lumped together, uh, has a superior diagnostic accuracy in the prediction of acute coronary occlusion and long-term mortality, mortality compared to STEMI and non-STEMI. I think uh, my, my conclusion is that I, I can't deny them that, but I think there, there is sort of this lingering question of, okay, when we're looking at all comers, what is the clinical significance of this small improvement? I don't deny that it's an improvement, uh, and I think it's important for sure, um, but I think uh, repeating this study prospectively and powered for benefits to mortality uh, with the perspective of intervention would be uh, a really useful way uh, for us to kind of have a better sense of, of, of what the clinical utility is. So just to, to re-summarize the, the evidence uh, that I found regarding the STEMI equivalents. Um, so the modified Scarbosa criteria Sensitivity and specificity in the 90s, uh, a really good tool, maybe a bit challenging to use. Uh, 
Um, the V1 T wave uh, spent sensitivity and specificity is in the 70%, and there is some evidence that, that it usually corresponds with uh, a left circumflex lesion. Wellens, 75% uh, of uh, people with the Wellens, uh, the evidence suggests, have critical LAD disease. And it's important that, to remember that this can be in a pain-free patient with negative troponins, and it can still be something we might want to talk to our, our, our friendly neighborhood interventionists about. Hyperacute T waves, uh, also known as the D De Winters T waves, uh, were found to be very uh, highly sensitive and specific uh, in the three studies that were done. And I think the important caveat there is, again, to remember that 2% of these people might never go on to progress to full-on ST elevation, and they might only ever have the hyperacute T wave. So an important, small but important subset of those patients. And with AVR, uh, ST elevation with multi-lead ST depression, um, looking at the various studies, there's sort of a range from the 70s to 80s. Um, regarding sensitivity and specificity. It's something that's very specific, uh, usually for left main coronary artery disease or triple vessel disease, uh, but an important thing to keep in mind as well. The last thing that I wanted to, to make a point, and this was something that uh, when Dr. Uh, Ward was helping me prepare, prepare for this, was this was something we kind of kept circling back to is that ultimately uh, the ECG comes with a patient and that, that should be uh, first and foremost. Uh, obviously, the, the, the point of this conversation today was, was to explore some of the evidence around these ST, um, these potentially STEMI equivalent or high risk ECGs. But uh, going back to that fourth universal definition um, the, that we incorporate an ECG into the picture of the biomarkers, the clinical history. So, I, I just, just to illustrate this again, I have a, a 65 year old male with chest pain and a clinical history of diaphoresis, nausea, and crushing retrosternal chest pain. Uh, with a history of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and a lifelong smoker with a troponin bump, uh, that person with maybe um, non-criteria ST elevation might very well warrant a call to the, to the interventionalist compared to a 45-year-old female uh, with chest pain um, th that's pleuritic after three days of cough with uh, chest wall tenderness palpation with no significant past medical history and non-smoker and negative drugs. So I think something we all know and appreciate, but uh, it's something that I did want to uh, drive home as a final point. So uh, that uh, really concludes uh, my presentation for today. Um, thank you so much for listening. I I'd be happy to entertain any questions or comments.